Good evening. My name is Dr. David Doman, and welcome to another edition of House Call. What is new with stroke identification and treatment? Find out more right now. this evening is Dr. Andrew Stemmer, the director of the Comprehensive Stroke Center at MedStar Georgetown Medical Hospital. Andrew, welcome to House Call. Thank you. Happy to be here. So we have an important topic tonight, but before we go on to discuss strokes, let's discuss briefly your professional background. Sure, sure. I, um, I was raised in uh, Northwest Indiana, uh, and then uh, did most of my early training in Chicago. Uh, went to school at Northwestern and did my medical school and neurology training at Rush University in uh, Chicago. Did a year of fellowship in uh, vascular uh, diseases of the brain and uh, University of California, San Diego. And then came out to DC for a three-year subspecialty fellowship in neurointerventional radiology, which is the minimally invasive procedures of the blood vessels of the brain. And since then I've been at Georgetown for the last nine years. Terrific. So let's go on to discuss strokes. The technical term, as you all know, cerebrovascular accident, CVA. Briefly, uh, how common are strokes in the USA at this time? Well, uh, pretty common. Um, uh, just to get to put it in context, stroke is the number one cause of adult disability, not only in the United States, but the entire Western hemisphere. And it's the number five cause of death. To answer your question, there's about a million strokes a year in the United States. And about 85% of those are ischemic strokes, which is um, not enough blood and oxygen gets to a part of the brain. And about 15% are hemorrhages where a blood vessel has a leak. But most of the time when we talk about strokes, we talk about the ischemic strokes, which is a blockage of a blood vessel. Briefly, what are some of the uh, causes of the different types of strokes, the ischemic versus the hemorrhagic, the one where they bleed? Yeah, so some of the risk factors can be similar, things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. But for ischemic strokes or blockages of, of the blood vessels in the brain, the, the key is really understanding the cause of them so that we can prevent any more. Um, there is the acute treatment, which we'll talk about, but, but in terms of what causes strokes, there's, there's a few main causes. Some of them are narrowing of the blood vessels in the neck or in the brain. That's called atherosclerotic disease, and that's due to the combination of high blood pressure, and cholesterol, and sugars. Uh, and then there are blood clots that come from somewhere else, like the heart, and can get pumped out anywhere, including the brain. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other causes that, that, uh, that are a little bit less likely, but primarily I would say the heart, uh, for various reasons, and the blood vessels um, are, are the main cause. You mentioned the heart. Uh, explain to our viewers uh, what you mean by the heart uh, leading to a stroke, and in particular, uh, our viewers hear more and more about the term AFib, atrial fibrillation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the heart can do a number of things uh, that cause strokes. So if we think about um, the valves of the heart, if there's an infection of a valve or if there's something wrong with the valve, that can form clots. If the heart itself doesn't pump well enough, uh, congestive heart failure, clots can form in the heart from that standpoint. And then to answer your question, one of the most common things is if there's an arrhythmia or an irregular rhythm of the heart. And the most common one is atrial fibrillation. And that's where one part of the heart just sort of fibrillates or quivers instead of fully pumping. And when that happens, uh, and it can go in and out of a normal rhythm, but when that happens, clots can form. And then those clots eventually can get um, pumped out to the rest of the body or the brain. So that explains to our viewers why on television now is advertised blood thinning agents. Go further mm -hmm. on that. 
Yeah, this is true. This is true. There's lots of commercials for newer types of blood thinners. Um, in the past, this would have been medicines like Coumadin or Warfarin, um, but there's a newer generation of medications, um, Apixaban, for example, um, Digibitran, this is Pradoxa or Zeralta or Eliquis, et cetera. A lot of commercials for them, but they've been a big step forward in the treatment of atrial fibrillation and preventing strokes. So, so when these medications are taken properly, they dramatically reduce the risk of clots. All right. So hopefully our viewers have already learned an important message from your interview this evening. Briefly tell our viewers about the signs and symptoms of a stroke, because there are many. Yeah, right, right. Um, you know, in general, because the brain controls just about everything we do, um, it just depends where the stroke is. Uh, so you can have almost any type of a symptom, but primarily what we're looking for are symptoms that affect one side of the body or the other. Um, so in a general sense, since the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, you're looking for symptoms that um, either of one side of the face or one side of the body, like an arm or a leg, that can have numbness, that can have weakness, you can have vision problems to one side or the other, you can have balance problems to one side or the other, and you can have speech problems as well. So, so there are acronyms, one of them is FAST, uh, F-A-S-T, so F is face, um, A is arm, S is speech, and T is time, because time is, is very important uh, in the setting of a stroke. And let's immediately focus and emphasize the time variable here. One of our viewers, let's say, is at home and, and uh, their spouse notices that the individual has a little slurring of the speech. Uh, and he uh, blows it off and says, oh, I'm just a little tired tonight. Uh, and the wife says, no, honey, that, that could be a, an early stroke. You should go to the emergency room. What would you tell uh, that couple right now yeah, this is a really important topic. I appreciate you bringing this up. Um, uh, as usual, the wife is right. Uh, <laughs> they should go to the emergency room. Uh, you know, this stroke can be a spectrum from mild to severe symptoms. And so it is tempting with mild symptoms to, um, to hope that it goes away uh, or to expect that it will get better. Uh, but in treating stroke, in the acute treatment, you just have the first couple of hours. And for medicines that can go into the IV that are clot-busting medications to break up one of these clots in the brain, uh, you only have up to four and a half hours to, to administer that from the beginning of the symptoms. And so the sooner you get in, the better it is. Um, if it turns out that it goes away and that it's nothing, then that's great, but you can't take that chance. And so public awareness and public education uh, is very important. And if you can't bring the person or loved one in, then you have to call paramedics. And what happens if you are given the opportunity to intervene? Uh, can you potentially completely reverse the event or greatly reduce its consequences? Absolutely. Um, Stroke is one of the few, if not the only neurologic disease that can be completely reversed when it's recognized and treated early. Uh, very few other neurologic diseases can say that, but there's no question that the tools we have now are, are better than they've ever been. And, and there's an absolute ability to improve the symptoms if not completely eliminate them altogether. But it does depend on a timely recognition uh, arrival at the hospital and then activation of the stroke team. So if he agrees to his wife's urgent recommendation, honey, go to the emergency room and they both go to the ER, what can they expect from the moment they hit the, uh, that department in terms of diagnostic evaluation yeah. and your therapeutic intervention if it's called upon? Sure, sure. Well, there's a few things. First, it, it, you come in by yourself or a family or, or, or loved one brings you in, uh, you, you wanna tell, tell the first person that you see that you're suspicious for a stroke. Um, stroke will be one of those keywords that anybody at any front desk or any triage area of the ER will recognize as, as an emergency and will escalate that into a, um, a stroke code, uh, which is uh, sort of the emergency pathway 
um, for, disease, for diseases, not unlike if someone presents with a heart attack. You know, they have a different code, a different protocol for that. There will be a lot of attention uh, very quickly. There will be things like vital signs, what's the blood pressure, uh, what's the heart rate, uh, and then you will go immediately to a CAT scan. Uh, and there will be a CAT scan to look at the brain, there will be a CAT scan to look at the blood vessels, and there may be a CAT scan to look at the perfusion of the brain as well to see if there's a part, certain area that's not getting enough blood flow. Uh, so that would be the initial um, part of the workup. And then based on that, we would determine if someone is a candidate for an acute treatment or intervention. So, um... If let's take the other extreme, let's say our uh, uh, patient uh, tells his wife, "Honey, I've had a long day. I'm tired. Let me let me sleep on it, and we'll talk about it in the morning." He wakes up in the morning, and now he not only has uh, difficult speech, but is paralyzed on his right side, a syndrome you're well acquainted with, the left middle cerebral artery syndrome. Sure. So now he, uh, an ambulance is called, he goes to the ER. What can be offered for him at that time? Yeah, this is a common scenario. About one in five people wake up with a stroke. And so even if you didn't know you had symptoms when you went to bed, about one in five strokes will happen while people are sleeping. And you, you really don't usually know, did it happen one minute after you went to sleep or did it happen one minute before you woke up? Um, most of these people are not eligible for the main IV treatment, which is called TPA or tissue plasminogen activator. It's a clot busting medication because that goes in the IV and can only be given within four and a half hours from when the symptoms started. And if you, and if you don't know when the symptoms started, you have to use the safest possible time, which would have been before they went to bed. Now, the other main line of treatment is for large strokes and the, and the type you described could be, a, could be eligible, uh, which is called mechanical thrombectomy, which basically is a minimally invasive way to go from the inside of the blood vessel, uh, usually from the, the hip area or from the wrist area. And you go in with a small tube and you watch under x-ray and you take pictures and you go into the brain and you pull the clot out. Uh, and that's a minimally invasive form of brain surgery. And that is, um, available for some patients, um, depending on where the location of the stroke is and the severity. So, so the patient you described may be eligible for that, but would not be eligible for the IV medication. Circle back to um, the stroke that occurs while someone is sleeping. What do you have to lose if you just give them the, the uh, clot buster anyway? Yeah, well, um, it turns out that the sooner you, you lyse the clot, the sooner you break up the clot, the better chance you have of, of saving that brain tissue. But conversely, the later you give it, not only the less effective it is, but the more dangerous it can be. Anytime you're talking about blood thinners or clot busting medications, the risk is the risk of bruising or bleeding. And so the risk of a brain hemorrhage increases as you get over that four and a half hour time limit. That's why the time is so critical. More with my guest, Dr. Andrew Stemmer of the MedStar Georgetown Stroke uh, Clinic. We'll be right back. Right here, baby. The sooner you recognize the signs of autism, the sooner you can make a lifetime of difference for your child. Start by answering a few simple questions at screenforautism.org. We're back and we're discussing tonight with Dr. Andrew Stemmer, the Diagnosis and Management of Stroke. Andrew, I have a question, which I'm sure many of our viewers want. They may be open that if something happens suggestive of a stroke, that there's a necessity to seek medical care right away. But that's not always viable. What happens, for example, if you're flying over the Atlantic on a trip, or you're in a, um, in a country where uh, there is no medical center nearby? Uh, is it viable to uh, try and bridge that gap until they can get medical care with an aspirin? Well, there, there's a little bit to unpack here. So, so let me try to do it the best I can. Um, you bring up a good point that a lot of people sort of commonly think if you, if you could be having a stroke, then you should take an aspirin. Um, I, 
I think that's probably not the right thing to do for stroke. That, that is a lot of the public education around things like heart attacks, uh, which, which are similar to the strokes in the brain, but, but not exactly the same. Uh, the reasons why I would not recommend the aspirin before I get to the second part of the question, the reasons I don't recommend the aspirin are one, a lot of times people are having a stroke and they can't swallow safely. And so you don't want to risk aspirating or having an aspirin go into the lungs or anything like that. And two, you know, there is a 15% chance it's a bleed in the brain. And if it's a bleed in the brain, you won't know until you get the CAT scan. And so you don't want to be taking an aspirin, which is a antiplatelet medication or a form of a blood thinner if there's a bleed. So, so for those reasons, I would not recommend the aspirin. I would recommend getting to the hospital. Now, the second part is um, not everybody lives close to a stroke center. Uh, and what do you do in those circumstances? You know, on a plane is a uniquely different, uh, difficult type of circumstance, but let me deal with people who live in more rural parts of the country. Um, one of the things we have done is we have a telestroke network, uh, which is um, telemedicine, uh, but for acute stroke. So it's, it's staffed by neurologists like myself who have expertise in stroke patients. And every one of our MedStar hospitals um, has this capability. So we have MedStar hospitals from the north of Baltimore to the southern tip of Maryland. Uh, some are urban and some are rural and some are in the middle. Um, and all of them have this capability where there is a video cart in the emergency room and uh, the stroke neurologists from our academic centers can beam in 24 uh, seven to see and evaluate these patients. So that's an emerging technology that is helping to bridge the gap um, but is still, um, still evolving. Do all hospitals have the capability to deal with a stroke or do, do they sometimes require transfers? Yeah, yeah, good question. You know, different hospitals have different capabilities. So very few hospitals have the capability to do everything. Uh, some of the things we've discussed, like the mechanical thrombectomy, where you do the procedures to pull out the clots, that's at very few hospitals. Uh, in, in DC, that exists at um, Georgetown and MedStar Washington Hospital Center, but for example, does not exist at sort of, at sort of smaller community level hospitals. Um, there are different levels of stroke centers. Most hospitals have some capability to deal with stroke, um, but if they don't have all of the capabilities, it does require urgent transfer. That can either be done by ground, like an ambulance, or oftentimes with a helicopter. Uh, what is a mobile stroke unit? Well, one of the interesting things that is um, uh, being studied and, and, and um, looked at in some major cities is, a, is an ambulance that has a CAT scan inside of it. So, so for example, one of the issues is that an ambulance might pick up a, a patient with a suspected stroke, but it takes 20 or 30 minutes to get to the emergency room. And so if you can get that CAT scan done, then you can start making treatment decisions while the patient is still en route to the hospital. Every minute counts when we're talking about an acute stroke. And so we're looking at all sorts of ways to cut down you know, seconds and minutes where we can. And one of them is the possibility of a specially equipped ambulance with the CAT scan inside of it. So that's called a mobile stroke unit. It, it's encouraging in its early um, iterations or early versions. Uh, and I think that this is something that may become more widespread. Explain to our viewers, when you look at a CAT scan of a stroke victim, how do you distinguish between a, a reduced blood flow, ischemic stroke versus a hemorrhagic, a, a bleeding stroke? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, the short answer is that on a CAT scan, the blood is bright. And, and, um, and a, an ischemic stroke where you don't have enough blood, that, that part of the brain is dark on a CAT scan. Now, now just to drill down a little further though, in, in a patient with a blockage of a blood vessel, you ideally want the scan of the brain to look normal because if you already see the stroke, then it's already probably too late. But you want to see normal brain tissue, and that lets you know that you have the opportunity to still save that tissue. It might be at risk, but it's not yet irreversibly injured. It's not, it's not dead yet. Let's go on to discuss uh, the other options you have for stroke treatment. So if somebody has had a stroke and you're left with some neurologic deficit, what is the next step? Yeah, yeah. So 
I think one way to think about this is, is just, um, you know, stroke is really a multidisciplinary field. I mean, it really takes a village to treat people who have a stroke. And that starts with, you know, public awareness and knowledge of a stroke. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to people about the signs and symptoms of a stroke. Um, paramedics play a, play a hugely important role in recognizing symptoms. You know, they have a thousand diseases they treat, but recognizing stroke is important. Getting someone to the right hospital is important. Um, once you're in the emergency room, obviously there's the whole team in the ER, the neurologist, then you have the intensive care unit. But after a stroke happens, you know, there's a lot of improvement and a lot of work in terms of uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. We are really lucky to have an excellent rehab hospital, the National Rehabilitation Hospital here in Washington, D.C., which is one of the premier sort of neuro rehab centers in the country. Um, things like stroke, things like neurotrauma, um, uh, very advanced facilities. There's a lot of excellent research going on into um, the right type of rehab, the right timing of rehab, the right intensity of rehab, various models for rehab. So, so there's a lot that can be accomplished. And, and the fact of the matter is that many people after stroke recover, even if they didn't get the acute treatment that gives them the best chance to recover. But, but other people still oftentimes recover. It takes time and might not be 100%, um, but there is a, a real opportunity to improve with the rehabilitation. Does the timing of the rehab matter? Is it better to start it within days of the event or do you wait weeks or, or what have you? It's a really interesting question. Um, the, I think the short answer is earlier is generally better than later, but there is such a thing as too early. And so while someone's still healing and recovering and there's still inflammation, you can't push too hard too soon. Um, that can have effects. One of the studies that, that we are doing here at Georgetown is looking at certain blood markers, biomarkers that can tell us when is the right window to start that stroke rehab. So, so yes, I think in general, earlier is better and we do try to get involved early, but, but it's not exactly clear um, you know, in every patient when that is. You mentioned an interesting aspect of the stroke and that is not only the acute event, whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic, but after the event, there is an inflammatory component. Is there any benefit for anti-inflammatories to ameliorate the event and accelerate recovery? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I, I would just sort of describe it like this, um, just to phrase it a little differently. You know, a stroke is an injury, much like any others. And, and if you think of it like a, like a sprained ankle, you know, after you sprain your ankle, it swells up. And, and so it takes time for that swelling to go down and then you can use your, you know, use your ankle again or your foot again, but it takes time. And similarly in the brain, after a stroke, there's oftentimes swelling. Now in general, the bigger the stroke, the more the swelling. Um, but it's not always, you know, um, easily predictable. Um, and the swelling in the brain typically peaks at about days three to five, um, but can last for, for up to weeks after that. Your question is about anti-inflammatories, and to the extent those have been tested, they don't seem to be effective for the type of inflammation in the brain. Now, we do have other types of medicine for people that have really bad swelling, um, what's called malignant edema. There, there are some medications that can, can try to pull some of the uh, fluids out of the brain to create a little more space because the brain is locked in the skull, um, but not really the anti-inflammatory medicines that you're thinking of. Those have been tested and so far not found to be positive. So for example, there's no role for IV steroids? Correct, not okay. at the moment. Okay. Uh, our colleagues in cardiology uh, besides getting EKGs, uh, of course, have the opportunity to order so-called cardiac enzymes to follow the event in, with a heart attack. Do you have any parallel lab tests that help diagnose and monitor a stroke? This has been looked at. This has been chased after for a long time. There's nothing that exactly parallels an EKG. Now, um, the CAT scan helps. Uh, MRI is an even better look at uh, whether there more definitively is or is not a stroke. 
An MRI is a harder thing to typically get in the emergency room setting. Some places can do it, um, but most places um, that, that's something that happens overnight uh, or during the course of the hospitalization, but not emergently in the first 10 minutes or something like that. So there is not, unfortunately, a blood um, parallel like a troponin or an EKG aside from the imaging. Um, now, now, it is important to say that the imaging has gotten much, much better. And so our ability to look at the blood vessels in real time, to look at the blood flow in real time has really pushed the field forward. Uh, and helped us to try to treat each individual person um, based on their own dynamics. Um, but there's not exactly an EKG in the way you're describing, unfortunately. As you know, sometimes what you determine with your radiographic studies is the real underlying culprit is reduced blood flow going through the carotid arteries, the major arteries in the throat, uh, the neck that go up to the brain. So if you find that on, on your radiologic study, what's the next step for the patient? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. This is, this is a, these are challenging cases. These are big blood vessels. I think um, there's a few options. Um, one of them is if it's completely blocked and that's an acute blockage in the last several hours, then, then generally the idea would be to go inside and try to open that up uh, through the blood vessels like we were describing earlier. And um, sometimes you can use a balloon or, or a stent, similar to the, how they, the cardiologists do in the heart, uh, but can do that in the neck. Um, now, if it's open, but it's narrowed, then, then you don't always have to emergently treat at that moment, but it does become a question over the next hours and days of, um, can we treat it with medicines, with aggressive medical care, or do we need an intervention like a stent or, or a open surgery? A, called a carotid endarterectomy where they, they scoop out the plaque. So, so it depends a little bit on how severe the narrowing is or if it's completely blocked. Many of your patients I'm sure ask, well, if I'm starting physical therapy, uh, what is the duration of therapy? At what point you say to them, uh, what you uh, are gonna get, you've achieved. And you have one minute. <laughs> well, uh, you know, everybody's different and, and, and strokes are different in different people. So, so there is not one answer to, you know, when are you done uh, with therapy? It really does depend on each person. I think that there's no question that over the first three months, we see dramatic improvement. But frankly, you see, still see improvement six, 12 or 24 months out. Now, now the slope might not be as, as severe, but, but patients who work at it, time makes a difference. Therapy makes a difference. Um, so really, you can be, you know, several years out and still see slow advancement. So I really would not put a cap on. It. Great. Uh, Andy, this has been a terrific interview. Thank you for your providing important information for the general public. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's been fun. My thanks to Dr. Stemmer. My thanks to my terrific team at the studio. And my thanks to you, the viewer, for joining us this evening. You can reach me at my practice website on the bottom of the screen if you have any questions or suggestions. Uh, as for my next program, it's gonna be an important program. We'll be giving an update on the latest uh, therapy for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. See you then next time for another edition of House Call. Good evening. Mm -hmm.